Okay, so I'll be talking about black hole complementarity and uh, trying to connect some more dots. Um, and uh, I guess I, I sh should mention this is based on some recent work with uh, Lauris Thorlacius and some earlier work with uh, uh, him and uh, Klaus Largo. Okay, so I'll begin with just a brief uh, discussion of effective field theory and uh, try and clear up some of these issues about measuring measurements and their relation to correlation functions and effective field theory. Uh, and I'll argue it's conventional on the outside and rather fuzzy on the inside. So an idea that's compatible with black hole complementarity um, and uh, also very similar to what the fuzzball people were, are saying. Um, I'll then talk about local observables near the horizon. And one of the things I'll argue is firewalls are, are a generic firewall is going to be visible from the outside. Um, and I'll, I'll show that by thinking about scalars in a Schwarzschild background and just explicitly computing a one-point function that uh, illustrates that. And I'll try and set that calculation up in a way that you can promote it to, to see what's going to happen if we uh, uh, look at uh, generic pure state uh, black holes. And uh, we'll see what happens there. And I'll uh, end with some uh, comments uh, somewhat related to some of the things uh, Eric and Herman were talking about yesterday. OK, so let me begin by just giving a brief review of how we think about measurements in quantum field theory. Um, so quantum field theory gives us some set of correlators. And I want to talk about the physical meaning of these correlators. So usually, we, when we compute a correlator of a couple of fields, we have in mind that we're actually coupling those fields to some large measuring apparatus. Um, and projecting the, the field into some kind of uh, eigenstate, for example, of momentum. So that's what LHC detectors do, for example. Um, and if you want to do this in a very mathematically precise way, you only have a shot at doing this uh, at infinity. Okay, so if we want to think about doing it near a black hole, I mean, it'll still work work well as long as we stay several Schwarzschild radii away. Um, if we want to have a big detector uh, closer than that, then we have to worry about trying to support it there and all the acceleration radiation that that is going to create. And it, it starts to get rather uh, murky what we're actually measuring um, in that kind of situation. So the relation between this notion of measurement and the correlation functions that our theory is presumably providing us with becomes progressively murky as we get to close to the horizon. And once we go inside the horizon, uh, all bets are off for some kind of mathematically precise relation between correlators and measurements. So. Um, yeah, so I, I'm imagining we have some kind of microscopic theory that gives us some complete set of microscopic correlators. Uh, then our challenge is to uh, interpret those in terms of what people see at different points in the space time. But doesn't this depend on whether you are static or whether you fall? If you go just in inertial motion towards the black hole, even if it's 2 m away, if it's a very big black hole, yeah, I, there's nothing you need to support. You just go in and you're, uh, locally, everything looks like Minkowski space. Well, it's still pretty low curvature space. So why would there be any problem with uh, effective field theory correlators? Um, well, maybe I should continue with this discussion, which will 
kind of address that. Um, so yeah, if we're freely falling very close to the horizon, um, we only have a proper time of order m to live. Um, so we have an old, uh, a limit to the kinds of energies we can resolve. Um, so our, the kind of measurements we do and the very precise correlators our microscopic description might give us um, are, are no longer uh, related in some kind of very precise way. So our the observables that we measure acquire start to acquire some kind of fuzzy nature. David, this is really a question of relative scales, right? That's you know, right. There's the conventional story that planet Earth could have just across the horizon of a huge black hole, and you know, we're making measurements. That, that's one of the points the I'm going to make, yeah. Yeah, you could have something that's quite sharp. Um, anyway, so because of this fuzzy nature, there's a potential for non-locality in correlators that is invisible to the observables. Again, they're, they're, it's a question of scales, and that's really what it uh, comes down to. Um, but uh, this is one scale that you're not going to get away from once you're inside the horizon. OK, so when correlation functions in the bulk are local, um, we can view some kind of local effective field theory is essentially just a summary of this set of correlators. So black hole complementarity suggests we can always use uh, some kind of local effective field theory uh, outside the stretched horizon of the black hole. And again, the fuzzball picture um, is, is compatible with that kind of uh, idea. Uh, if we want to use effective field theory inside the horizon, um, essentially what we have to do is take our exact uh, correlators that might represent observables inside the horizon um, and according to black hole complementarity they will not uh, behave in a local way with respect to the guys that we've set up outside. Uh, but we can tr try and uh, throw away the non-local part of those correlators and define some kind of inside effective field theory that's still local and unitary, but we've truncated the correlators. So it's now only some kind of approximate description of the true underlying dynamics. So localized observers will still find some kind of local unitary description that's predictive, which I think the kind of thing some of the comments were, were getting at. Uh, but it will not agree with the uh, exact effective field theory uh, outside. Okay, so if we want to construct an effective field theory, we can do it uh, for different patches of the space-time in general. We can be very successful in making predictions with these unitary effective field theories. Um, but when we try and relate them to our fundamental underlying microscopic description, uh, we have to worry about the fact that, uh, in general, there are only some approximate description of what's going on. And they may not all patch together in such a way that your global effective field theory is local. OK. so. So let me now turn uh, and talk about pure states and complementarity. So um, I'd like to avoid in this talk having to talk about uh, the interior of the black hole. We heard a lot about that yesterday. And I guess my point of view would be that this interior description is going to be highly dependent on your underlying quantum theory. Um, so what I'd like to try and do for today is just focus on some universal questions um, that one can ask outside the 
stretched horizon of a black hole where at least most of us uh, would agree there's some kind of uh, local unitary effective field theory that goes all the way David, out to infinity. Let me ask a yeah. quick question about the interiors. This is my last chance. Is that statement supposed to mean that you think that the degree to which effective field theory is valid for the infalling observer is highly dependent on the underlying quantum model and you know, so not predictable in advance? Um, well, uh, if the infalling observer is outside the horizon but infalling, um, I mean, once they cross the horizon. After they cross. After they cross. Um, or maybe you're just declaring that you don't know and don't want to deal with that problem. I, to I, I think we heard a lot about it yesterday, so <laughs> um, that will be my answer. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, it's something I'd like to think about more in the future. But so th there have been a lot of, I guess, retreat from the fact that uh, there's maybe a sign of the firewall outside. But I I'd like to argue that uh, that that is in fact uh, not the case, and, and just uh, think about uh, computing a, the expectation value of some scalar stress energy tensor in in, in the Schwarzschild. Uh, background. Okay, so just a free scalar field uh, coupled to gravity. Okay, so let me just review some old facts from the 1970s. Um, there were various competing vacuums at that time, um, and one that's quite relevant for the discussion is known as the Boulware vacuum. Um, so that's the, the vacuum state where we just use short shield time to decide whether modes have positive uh, frequency. Uh, and we do that for the ingoing modes and the outgoing modes as well. So, um, so as, as Lenny told us yesterday, uh, short shield time doesn't uh, allow us to cross the horizon. Um, so. This gives us a, a model for, for states where you, you might have perhaps a, a mirror boundary condition near the horizon or perhaps even a generic membrane. And what you find is not some kind of small uh, stress energy near the horizon. You find a, a genuine power law divergence on both the past and the future horizon. And, uh, I'll go into the details of that a little more uh, in a moment. Um, a more popular vacuum here is the hartle hawking vacuum. Um, in this case, uh, we use crystal time on the past uh, horizon to uh, distinguish our positive frequency outgoing modes and the crystal coordinate on the future horizon to di distinguish the positive frequency ingoing modes. So that, if we use that definition of uh, the vacuum state, we, we find a stress energy that's smooth on both the past and the future horizons. Now the surprising thing that came out of that was that if you then look at the stress tensor at infinity, you find you're not only uh, getting Hawking radiation coming out, you're having to send it in. Whereas in the Boulware vacuum, um, no radiation goes in and uh, no radiation comes out. Okay, so, so that's good for thinking about a black hole in thermal equilibrium. Now the, maybe the most important vacuum for the uh, present set of discussions is the Unruh vacuum. Um, this is a kind of uh, mixture of the two. So for the ingoing modes, we use short shield time uh, to set up positive frequency modes. And for the outgoing modes, we use the, the crystal time on the past horizon. Okay, so we do our computation and find that the stress energy is smooth on the future horizon. But like the Boulware vacuum, 
there's a power law divergence on the past horizon. And that's maybe something people should watch out for when thinking about these doubled CFTs. Uh, any generic in falling state from the right is going to give you a singular past horizon if you're worried about that. OK, but th this gives us a good model for black holes formed and collapse. We can um, actually generalize this to arbitrary in falling states and the stress tensor will stay smooth on the future horizon. So let's look at this in a little more detail. And I'll use some results by Candelis from the early 1980s. Um, and to simplify things, I'll just look at the expectation value of phi squared to save writing a lot of indices. And since it's a free scalar field, you can always take derivatives of this to construct the stress energy tensor and uh, contract it with some unit normal um, time-like geodesics um, to get the energy density seen by some freely falling uh, in falling observer. OK. so. I kind of like this formula. It uh, um, reminds me of the ultraviolet catastrophe formula in uh, black body radiation. Um, and we can see most of the features um, just by kind of eyeballing it. Um, so in particular, the, well, these R's are some complicated radial functions. But this uh, is reflecting the fact that in this unroof vacuum, we have a thermal distribution of, of outgoing modes. OK, so if we do these derivatives and look at the limit of this on the future horizon, um, there's going to be a, a lot of divergences uh, coming from the limit where r goes to 2 amp. So these two terms here are renormalization counter terms that uh, are coming when you do the proper uh, uh, renormalization of this operator. And there's a delicate cancellation as R goes to 2M uh, between uh, this term uh, and these terms. OK, so it only works if you have this exactly thermal, well, essentially only works if you have this ex exactly thermal function here. On the other hand, if we uh, look at this term uh, in the limit that R goes to 2M, um, it's just finite. So we, we could have whatever ingoing modes we want and get a lot. In, in principle, we could uh, easily generalize this expression to have uh, whatever ingoing modes we want here. And it won't change the divergence properties of uh, phi squared. OK, so we have a lot of freedom in what we can send in. But if we try to do any kind of uh, projection on what's coming out and change that uh, purely thermal uh, state coming out, um, we will immediately see a, a divergence on the, uh, outside the stretched horizon. OK, and if we do uh, hurdle hawking um, we get another cotange factor here. Um, so in that case, um, if, even if we went to the past horizon, we would have a smooth uh, expectation value of T mu nu. So in the past horizon, the roles of these two uh, terms essentially swap. Um, and for the bullware vacuum, um, neither of these terms has a thermal factor in front of it. Um, and is divergent both on the past and the future horizons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to understand. Um, so you mentioned that a re renormalization. Uh, did you mean normal ordering? Or what, what, what actually is the prescription that determines the, uh, the counter terms? Uh, normally, 
I guess we would normal order, but in this case, if I subtract the vacuum expectation, computing a vacuum expectation value, so normal ordering has all kinds of ambiguity um, at this level. What's, yeah, what's so the prescription that gives you a unique answer? Here? Yeah, Candelas used uh, point splitting regularization. Um, I, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. it, it's a very messy calculation. It's a mess, but, uh, but, but he had a certain uh, canonical form for the short distance divergence that he accept, uh, that he wanted to subtract, uh, which one can think of as being? Uh, as a gravitational counter term. The condition is that the infalling observer doesn't see anything singular there. That's the prescription, I think, that uh, he was just asking about. I mean, just think about this in the rindler minkowski case. It's the condition that the uh, that you're in something like the Minkowski vacuum, uh, um, where you sail across the horizon without encountering a singularity. I think that's how you pick the vacuum, oh. but that's not how you choose your normalization scheme. No, well, okay. so he was asking about the yeah, no, yeah, the I, prescription. I think, I think maybe I can get, uh, maybe I can get the answer myself. Uh, so you take a local Minkowski uh, metric, you take you take the, ins uh, the inertial Minkowski metric, and that's the one relative to which you normal order. I guess that's that's yeah. That's an, I think that's basically another way to say it. Yeah, you can probably reinterpret it that way. Um, okay. Good. So if we replace this uh, outgoing mode distribution by any kind of non-thermal probability distribution, we get a naked firewall. So a couple of examples. Um, we could uh, imagine changing things so we have some eigenstate of the number operator of the outgoing radiation field. So instead of that uh, thermal factor, we just saw we might imagine replacing that by um, some, some of your favorite uh, delta function frequencies. And by the argument I just gave, um, by this formula, um, you're, you're going to get uh, a divergence well outside the, the horizon if you do that. So we're seeing there are genuine uh, divergences that appear mode by mode. So if you get rid of a single mode, um, there, there's going to be some uh, divergence left over from that uh, counter term. Okay. Um, and likewise, if you replaced your stretched horizon by perhaps a mirror or some kind of hot membrane, um, again, that would be like going to the bullware vacuum and replacing that uh, thermal factor by, by unity. You would, you would get a divergence. So typically, your infalling observer um, crossing, um, say, a radius R where the fiducial temperature is uh, T, would, e even your infalling observer would see uh, something of order a, a temperature uh, T in that situation. Okay, so. A very serious uh, naked uh, firewall. Just, just one, one question about the previous uh, slide. Uh, maybe you're going to come to this, but uh, the firewalls. I think the Don and uh, Joe and EMPSS have been talking about a very conservative firewalls. So they're decently clothed with an event horizon. They are not. Yeah, they're not naked firewalls of this kind, right? So you will. <laughs> they, they, they're. No, but the the, well, I mean, if they're eigenstates of the uh, radiation field, uh, then they would be, I, I'm just saying they would be naked. Well, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I thought they had an argument that the outside really looks like a thermal atmosphere and, and, and you know, the firewall is not so easily observable from the outside, but I, I, I won't speak for them. I, yeah. I agree. David will eventually tell us ways. Okay. Um, okay, so, so what I'd like to talk about now is to think about forming a black hole from a smooth collapse. And 
if we're in the uh, post page epoch, um, we, we could still imagine computing this expectation value by estimating uh, corrections to this exact thermality of the outgoing modes. So let's, let's try and do that. So we, we have some kind of local uh, probe near the horizon, and that'll have access to some uh, relatively small uh, subspace of the, of the outgoing modes. So if, if we place our probe very close to the horizon, then the, most of these modes will have been very recently uh, emitted. Uh, we'll call this subspace of the radiation A. Uh, and in this post page epoch, um, that'll be maximally entangled with the earlier radiation R. And we'll assume that's well space-like separated from, uh, from A. Okay, so let's uh, try and compute this uh, distribution function for these outgoing modes. Um, so we essentially have a pure state on this Hilbert space, A times R. We can construct a reduced density matrix. So if we're doing a measurement near the horizon, uh, according to Einstein locality, we should just uh, trace over the uh, space-like separated Hilbert space um, to define this reduced density matrix for the, the A modes, or the A degrees of freedom. Uh, and we can expand that if we want in terms of some uh, energy eigenstates or energy density matrices for the, uh, the, that live in the A space with some coefficients. Okay, so if we have a complex pure state, so some kind of state where we have a lot of entanglement between A and R, there's actually a nice uh, approximation scheme for uh, computing the, these corrections um, in a limit where um, the entropy or the dimension of the Hilbert space of R is much bigger than that of A. Okay, so we do this by integrating over uh, the, the possible unitary transformations that uh, move us around on this, uh, on this high dimension uh, Hilbert space. So when we do that, we, we get this answer. Uh, we get some large Hilbert dimension of Hilbert space dependent factors. Uh, we get some normalization of the uh, total dimension of the Hilbert space and some very small corrections. Okay, so let's process this a little bit. So um, both the radiation and the uh, uh, very recent radiation we're in thermal contact with our stretched horizon. So most recently, we're thinking of A and the stretched horizon as evolving unitar unitarily, um, which essentially makes DSDA, uh, DSDEA um, equal to DS sub B, DS EB if B is the stretched horizon. Um, and one can make the same kind of argument a little bit before for when the last bit of the uh, earlier Hawking radiation was emitted. Um, and between those two times, this temperature isn't really going to change very much. So to within small corrections, uh, both of these terms have the same effective temperature. So T is the adiabatic Hawking temperature of the black hole at that point. Okay, so we can tailor expand this uh, uh, function. Um, expanding in inverse powers of the entropy of the 
radiation. And if we put all that together, we find that this uh, reduced density matrix has this almost exactly thermal form uh, up to corrections that are of order e to the minus uh, the entropy of the large system of outgoing radiation. OK, so maximal entanglement of A with the much larger system and being able to trace over this much larger system kind of saves the day for us. And if we plug in and compute the stress energy tensor, um, we find it's actually suppressed by the exponential of the, uh, the entropy of the outgoing radiation. OK, so it, it's essentially uh, tiny on the stretched horizon, and we get no kind of naked firewall. OK, so, so I would view that as a success for black hole complementarity. Um, we've essentially shown that uh, if, if you have one of these radiation eigenstates, it's, um, it's not the relevant state for computing what a local infalling observer sees as they cross the horizon. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Well, I, I will just, you just use the words as they cross the horizon. I think you meant as they approach the horizon. Well, they, they can get up to the stretched horizon, yeah. They can even cross the stretched horizon. <laughs> but. Okay. I'm not sure I know what that means, but. <laughs> Sounds like you may be saying something more. Uh, let's at least try on that. It, that you're saying, uh, if you look at the stress tensor from the vacuum fluctuations just outside the horizon, there's some averaging that makes uh, those smaller than you might have expected. That's right. So every eigenstate so in this whether outgoing not, well, Hilbert space produces a much larger expectation value for the stress energy outside the horizon than you see when you actually uh, do this tracing over the over a uh, complex pure state. Okay, so since no one's going to object to that, let me. <laughs> uh, Tracing is done automatically as you do the computation, right? So if That's you just right. observe it. Yeah. So also, you know, if you project it on a definite, you know, state of, I guess you called it, well, of R, then yeah. then you would not have that cancellation. So you're That's saying right. it's a feature of this average over. That's right. Of, okay. So. Well, let me raise some objections then. So uh, it, if you were to measure this early outgoing radiation, you, you could imagine projecting the black hole into some NR eigenstate and then asking what happens uh, as this infolar approaches the horizon. So in that case, you might expect uh, the infolar to see the horizon, or perhaps not. Um, or you might even argue, uh, if you don't measure the radiation, um, decoherence will kind of do the job for you uh, and pro project you into some kind of uh, uh, eigen, essentially an eigenstate of NR. Um, because I guess one of the slogans of decoherence theory is that local interactions 
abhor non-local superpositions. And what we're concluding is we have to average over uh, macroscopic superpositions of different kinds of Hawking radiation in order to get rid of this firewall. Okay. If you want to have uh, some kind of uh, local superposition uh, or local eigenstate um, of the outgoing Hawking radiation, um, you're going to be in a situation where your outgoing state is very close to one of these NR eigenstates. And you're going to see a firewall outside the horizon. Yeah. So uh, I've heard this kind of view before, but what confuses me is that in principle, we're just talking about the matter that collapsed to form the black hole and the space around it. When we talk about decoherence, there's always an ancilla or some other system which will entangle itself with it. Here, yeah. in principle, of course, when there's a black hole, there's stars around and all that. But in principle, there's only the black hole and the space time. What is causing this decoherence? Exactly. <laughs> no. Oh, I, I'm going to talk more about okay. it. Uh, OK. Good. So well, to, to try to uh, illustrate some of the potential confusions, let me uh, try and confuse you about the EPR paradox. So let's imagine we have uh, a spin singlet. So we have some kind of tensor product running horizontally and uh, a sum with a minus sign running vertically. So, so th this is supposed to be a picture of a spin singlet. So, and we have Alice and Bob at space-like separations ready to do their spin measurements. OK, so uh, as came up in Herman's Herman and Eric's talk yesterday, if Alice makes a measurement, um, she will detect spin up or spin down with probability a half. Uh, likewise, Bob will measure spin up or spin down with probability a half. Um, so nothing too surprising there. Um, it gets a little more perverted, though, if, say, Bob makes a measurement. Let's say he measures spin up. And Alice declines to do her measurement but then moves up into the uh, causal future of Bob's measurement. Let's see. So now when Alice makes her measurement, naively it seems like the rules for probability have changed. She now does her measurement and with uh, unit probability finds spin down. Okay. so. There, there are different ways of uh, thinking about this, and the, I guess that's the interpretation in the usual Copenhagen uh, view of things. You could also work on some kind of big wave function that includes Bob and Alice. And even then, if you do that, then even then the rules up here for Alice making a measurement uh, are the same. She'll uh, measure probability up or down. Uh, with, uh, with equal probability, but at the same time, uh, she will uh, move on to a different branch of the big wave function then, and uh, then. see agreement with Bob's measurement. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a, a question. You, you were saying that Alice has to wait with doing her measurement until she's in the future cone uh, in order to have the perfect correlation. But I thought she could just do the, the measurements at a space like separated. That's obviously where the EPR paradox is coming from. That space like separated measurements still have can have correlations. So she doesn't need to wait until she's in the future to do her measurement. Right? No, she doesn't need to wait. So I'm she saying can do if, it she, earlier. if she waits. So if, if she but doesn't she wait, then she, uh, I, I said at the beginning, she measures up or down with probability a half. Uh, no, but it's still, uh, still, if she would do the measurement at the same time as the Bob and the two are specially like separated, then if later on they compare their measurements, they always find that it's consistent, regardless of whether they did it when they were. That, that's where these confusions start to creep in. Um, <laughs> 
uh, oh, you, you mean that, that she has received a classical message at that point from Bob saying that, okay, now if you go and do the measurement, I already can tell you what the outcome is? Uh, yes, that, that kind of thinking. So one has to be careful in uh, viewing uh, measurements versus, um, versus the kind of, uh, well, I guess you could phrase it as correlations. So the kind of local measurement that either of these observers do gives uh, up or down with probability one half. But once you get into computing those kind of conditional probabilities, which only become relevant once Alice moves into the future light cone of Bob, uh, it seems like the rules for uh, computing probabilities change. So let's think about this in the context of the uh, pure state black hole. So if we imagine this corresponds to some measurement of the distant uh, Hawking radiation, uh, then it, it, it's possible for, um, you know, if, if you're dead set on computing one of these conditional probabilities, um, it will be true in the future of such a measurement that uh, your correlation function will uh, change and it will then be given by some kind of um, eigenstate of the outgoing radiation and you will then see this very clear firewall outside the horizon. But if you're doing a local measurement uh, at space-like separations, um, you will, by the same token, not see this uh, firewall. I, I either didn't understand or don't agree with that last statement. I'm confused. You, you're, you're supposing that someone far away is doing a complete measurement of this thing you called R onto the, say, number eigenstate basis. Yep. Somehow they're doing that. Okay. And you say that even though that is taking place, you can have an observer who falls through the horizon or up to it sees just the average result and not, is not decoherent by this distant measure. Yes, so if, if they're doing their measurement at space-like separations from the measurement, um, this argument will apply. Yeah, um, the thing is, if I don't think it has anything to do with space-like or or time-like. You know, if Alice receives the measure, the piece of paper from Bob saying what Bob's measurement was, and she decides, oh, I'm not going to look at this. I don't care what Bob did, and just does the measurement. From her perspective, she sees exactly the same thing, whether she's time-like or space-like to Bob. So if I well, don't think it can be the case if Alice is jumping into a black hole that if she looks at a piece of paper, she gets burned up, and if she doesn't look at the piece of paper, she that, doesn't. Yeah, that is not what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. I might expect a, um, a different problem, I think. Uh, namely, again, if we think about sailing across the horizon and while you're conventionally allowed to do that. It's because you have this precisely correlated state of the just inside and just outside modes that's uh, it, where there's a cancellation that takes place in your interaction with those modes. And so you're saying if I look at the outside stress tensor and instead all of the modes are correlated with the past radiation, there's some averaging that makes that all smooth out to, to not be as bad as I might have expected. That's but, right. but then you've also decorrelated the inside modes with the there outside are no modes. Inside so, modes. You, well, sorry. <laughs> if well, you you don't want to think about them, but a lot of us here do. And so all of the inside modes are now decorrelated with the outside modes, and so you might have uh, still the same problem: a firewall basically just inside the horizon. If you look at the stress tensor of those you know modes, which you've decoupled <coughs> from the outside. So. Well, yeah, in the setup I've been describing, I only have effective field theory outside the stretched horizon. So um, I, I, I'm not going to touch that. We heard a lot about it yesterday. But I've already shown that if, if you have an eigenstate of this outgoing radiation, 
I mean, the, you already see a firewall outside the stretched horizon. There's no reason for it to hide behind the global horizon. Um, so it, it's something you can already address using uh, the kind of effective field theory that everyone agrees on without having to get into uh, uh, these uh, is, what, more advanced discussions that we heard about yesterday. So at the level of two qubits, I think the firewall question is that you have to do a bell measurement on both qubits to see or not see a firewall. What you're describing is doing a measurement on one qubit. So that will, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's supposed to show a firewall or not. The firewall question is a bell measurement on both the qubits. I, I disagree. So uh, I would, well, a, a firewall for me would be a, a quantity you can observe in a one-point function. So uh, a, as I've said, a local measurement uh, will correspond to tracing over uh, whatever measurements are being made over here. Um, so if Bob measures, uh, does a measurement of the spin, uh, what Alice is really going to be doing then is tracing over bobs that are some of which who have measured up and some of which who have measured uh, down. Uh, and in doing so, we'll not see a, uh, uh, a firewall. That's right. I, I'm not. I should not trying to say anything surprising on this slide. <laughs> so, okay, so it does have some bearing though on on the discussion because um, uh, by the same token, Alice cannot determine if her spin is entangled with Bob's. That's by right. A single uh, by That's a right. Yeah. She cannot determine if her spin is entangled with Bob's. Yeah. So, uh, so the fact that her spin is in a mixed state is something that she cannot determine by having a single spin. That's right. Yeah. So that is the point I'm trying to, or one of the points I'm trying to emphasize here. So if, if we really want to insist that Bob or someone outside the black hole has really projected the system into uh, some eigenstate of the outgoing radiation, um, you know, it, it really amounts to just changing our initial state so that we're just working with uh, this initial state rather than the singlet state that we uh, started with. Okay, so, so let, let me try and apply that a little more uh, sharply to the objections I raised. So if we have some large measuring apparatus projecting onto this. Um, you know, we expect some kind of very short uh, decoherence time scale because this uh, apparatus is very large. And um, you know, if we w really want to think about what's happening, there, there's going to be some kind of change in the state of the black hole. Um, and it's essentially going to be equivalent to putting the black hole into some non-generic state for the same reason that uh, the projection of the spin system corresponded to just changing the initial state so that you had a spin up and a spin down. So as I ar argued before, in that case, you really are going to see a firewall. Okay, so the issue for me then is, you know, if we're trying to form this black hole from smooth initial data, um, you know, we're not really going to be in one of these non-generic states. And I think one of the hidden assumptions in the firewall story is that this outgoing Hawking radiation is somehow decohering on its own into some local um, outgoing radiation state. So something close to one of these in our eigenstates. So if you don't use measurement to project onto one of these eigenstates, you could ask you know, whether this decoherence really works. And you know, in everyday life, decoherence works really well. If we open the box and look at Schrodinger's cat, we all agree on whether he's alive or dead fairly quickly. And 
you know, to actually do the computation. You have to think about how we're interacting with our environment and uh, compute a time scale. And for very large people, it's extremely short. So you might ask, you know, does that work for these out, this outgoing gas of uh, Hawking uh, particles? And this is where this free propagation of the Hawking modes away from the horizon kind of comes back to bite you. Because um, you try and compute the decoherence time scale, it's, it's basically infinite. So nothing is really preventing you from having this outgoing uh, set of macroscopic superpositions of the, uh, of the Hawking radiation. Um, so when you then go and compute uh, your expectation value of the stress energy tensor near the horizon, uh, you see no firewall. Well, OK, I really don't agree with that. You have well, a I, I just showed it before. <laughs> well, but if you have a quantum mechanical, maybe I just didn't understand, but if you have a quantum mechanical system and you have outgoing quanta and they just propagate away as a free field and go away, the effects are exactly the same whether or not somebody, from the perspective of somebody left behind by those quanta who doesn't have access to them, the effects are exactly the same whether it interacts with some other system and decoheres or not. Isn't that true? Yeah, okay, well then I must not be understanding the words. Maybe I think somehow they think they mean the opposite of what they mean. But you're, <laughs> you're saying free propagation pocking modes away from the horizon produces an infinite decoherence time scale, and that prevents the firewall? Well, you could really get, okay, so you're calling in the buffer with a, uh, I mean, you could somehow worry that you're interacting with the radiation cloud, somehow decoheres in a basis that it can already. And if that were true, I think Aaron is actually agreeing with what David said, but pointing out that uh, you don't need all the assumptions on this slide, and the conclusion is even stronger, that even if there is decoherence of the radiation far away by some other agent, you still have no firewall. So, okay. um, well, not, not if the, well, I mean, it, it, if your outgoing radiation is in an NR eigenstate, uh, and you do the computation of the, uh, uh, of the stress energy tensor, you find a firewall. So let me back up. So, so who's decoding? Who's decoding this radiation? I still don't get it. What's the environment? So he, here I, I'm doing this uh, trace, and I'm assuming I have a complex pure state. If I was in an R eigenstate, this would be wrong. If this is wrong, I get a firewall. <sighs> well, it doesn't just have to do with that, but I'm choosing not to talk about the firewall <laughs> inside the horizon. Because <laughs> I don't want to get into a discussion like yesterday. <laughs> uh, horizon, what you're saying is it's you could create a firewall by doing some extraordinary measurement on the radiation, but generic things you do outside would not create a firewall outside the horizon. This is, is this, uh, um, maybe I'm sorry I'm not understanding, but the statement is some generic interaction you had with the radiation outside would not create a firewall outside the horizon. But I thought that most of the arguments for the firewalls have to do with you know, them being just behind the horizon, not, not just outside the horizon. So I already showed before this slide that the arguments for the firewall lead to a firewall outside the horizon. If you work in this radiation eigenstate, you see a firewall outside the horizon. Every single eigenstate gives you a firewall outside the horizon. That's the point. <laughs> but 
but you're, every, uh, every basis element of your Hilbert space gives you a firewall. But nevertheless, when you put them in a complex pure state, the firewall goes away. Sorry, could I just ask a, a really simple question? Are, are you assuming that the information comes out in this argument, that everything is unitary? Yes. Yes. And is that is that assumption, that very first line, that you, you're starting with the pure state on A cross R, so that at every time the radiation near the horizon and outside is in a pure state? Uh, yes. So it, yes. So, so in your last comment about this basis of in our eigenstates, I assume this is a reference to, for example, the argument I gave in the last week in my recent paper with Joe. It, not directly, but it well, could well, be. You, did, you, you implied it has to do with the firewall argument. So I just wanted to, you know, to say that an important part of the argument I gave in the first talk of this workshop last week, which you weren't here for, okay, but it was in this paper I wrote with Joe a month or so ago, is that when we look at, we do use in that argument a basis of state, well, I wouldn't even call it basis, but anyway, we, we use states in which some mode has a definite eigenstate, and those span the relevant states. But it's, an important, it's important in our analysis that we use that to compute the average of a positive definite quantity that can't cancel out, that doesn't, can't have cancellation between different states. And your calculation, where you look at the stress tensor, is completely different because there are positive and negative stress tensor fluctuations. OK. Sorry. <laughs> even, more, even more basic, which is, uh, there was one argument you, you gave in your first paper which had to do with creating a firewall maybe outside the horizon, or I don't know, inside the horizon, but doing some very complicated measurement of the radiation. Now, as far as I understand, all the later arguments involve some uh, reference to the interior. Is this correct? Yeah, I mean, All of our arguments involve some reference to the some interior. Reference to the interior. So we have no argument that applies to the exterior. Well, maybe the f there's this argument which I think maybe you're addressing which involves doing a very complicated radiation measurement on the outside which could create a firewall outside the horizon. Okay, ne never mind. I, I, I agree. I, I would like to. I, so, but I, I just want to. If the infaller can manage to do a sufficiently complicated measurement, right. then it can. Then you can see it. Then they can see a trace of the firewall outside. Right, but, but, I just want to understand if, if you're addressing that arg if you're addressing that argument because, uh, if I if I understand correctly, all the other arguments involve some reference to the interior. So unless you make some reference to the interior. It's I mean, I find it hard to see how from an argument of this kind one could exclude a firewall that exists just behind the horizon, which, which, which I think, and I think their arguments don't lead to firewalls only outside the horizon, but uh, firewalls that could be just behind the horizon. Okay, well, I, I disagree with that, but um, for reasons I've explained, but um, that, that's, uh, what, I mean, one can take all these ideas and apply them to a particular model that reconstructs modes inside the horizon. And again, all the conclusions will largely carry over that um, as long as you're allowed to trace over these modes and as long as you're in a complex pure state, um, then this kind of structure will still emerge and these extremely small uh, corrections to what would have been an exactly thermal state. And I think everyone agrees in the heart that the hartle hooking state does not have a firewall. Um, they, they will, again, uh, suppress uh, the, the, the presence of any firewall. But there's about this that looks like positive for which it's hard to get cancellation. By summing over large numbers of, uh, I, I don't know. Why I, I don't want to get into that. Bit. But okay, so let me uh, conc conclude then. So um, okay, so what we seem to end up with, uh, which perhaps at least uh, I find surprising, is that the Hawking modes are really in a macroscopic superposition. And no one else seems to be worried about that, but let me uh, 
say why this is useful. Um, so uh, just to conclude, um, I, I've argued that black holes fruit form from some smooth initial conditions, produce no visible firewalls. And this is a nice test. I think that black hole complementarity passes. So what we have in the outgoing radiation is some non-decohering macroscopic superpositions of these outgoing states, which are an important part of the story. And if you want to construct interior observers who see local quantum mechanics, this is really a prerequisite because you can't have uh, the same state describing uh, the, the decoheres with respect to two completely different Hamiltonians. So uh, if you want your interior observers to see ordinary quantum mechanics, um, they're going to be viewing this state uh, from the point of view of their local Hamiltonian. Um, and they ought to be able to do their Schrodinger cat experiments and whatnot and uh, have ordinary decoherence. Um, the, one of the ways of phrasing the firewall problem is that you can't have uh, two uh, Hamiltonians that are not uh, local with respect to each other uh, decohere the same state. Um, so this, I think, op this observation, I think, opens the door to uh, having a conventional interpretation for these interior observers, because I, I feel like we were missing this point that uh, there actually is no uh, natural mechanism for uh, decohering these uh, outgoing Hawking states, and we end up with some complicated macroscopic superposition, which we're totally not used to dealing with in, uh, in our usual view of measurements. Yeah. In the real world with real black holes, these excitations will go out and they'll, they'll scatter on things. They'll scatter on the yep. microwave background and various other exactly. things. And so, and in fact, you know, that's going to produce decoherence ultimately. There's some time scale. You that's can try right. to estimate what it is. So I, I don't see how you can assert that you don't have decoherence. Don't know what basis it exactly it decoheres in, but uh, it does by those, those mechanisms. That's right. So I kind of already addressed that point before. So it, it, So if, if there is some operation that uh, changes the state of the black hole into a, uh, an eigenstate of the radiation number operator, then um, it's possible to uh, um, well, I don't know what get it into a non-generic state that uh, sees a firewall. We, I don't know what state we get it into by scattering off of all of the stuff it'll scatter off of, but it, it is going to have the effect of decohering it, and so that contradicts your third line uh, that it's non-decohering. No, so this slide kind of deals with with that uh, issue. So. If the measurement is space-like separated from the point at which you're doing the observations, there will still be no firewall because you'll still be tracing over the different uh, outgoing uh, superpositions. I think what's cr a critical reason why why you're Part of your argument here is that, um, from the perspective, you're only looking outside the horizon, and as Alice comes in, if she's just measuring the near horizon system, for you, whether or not there is a firewall does not correspond to a linear quantum operator. You're basically saying there's no firewall if it matches the Hartle Hawking state outside, but the Hartle Hawking state is a mixed state. 
And no, I, I, so I'm there's just no computing the expectation value of a linear quantum Right, operator. but as Don pointed out, that can be positive or negative. Sure. And, uh, and these things can cancel out. In regular quantum <laughs> mechanics, if you but have two kind of disjoint point, systems, if you have two disjoint systems, there's no way that somebody measuring one disjoint system can kill me in the other disjoint system. Yeah. Uh, I, I completely agree. Expectation values of what I see. If they measure something weird, if they get an atypical result, that could have an implications for what I see. But if I just know they made some measurement and got a typical that, result, it doesn't change my expectations. That, yeah, that was something I was trying to explain on one of the earlier slides, but <laughs> I guess it didn't quite work. But if you then go into the uh, future light cone of that. Uh, uh, person who did the measurement, then there is this sense in which one can compute conditional probabilities where the, the rules change. I certainly agree you can compute conditional probabilities and that you can see entanglements in that way. But if we're just talking about distant Hawking radiation, I don't see why the conditional probabilities matter. Say I only care, say Alice only cares whether I, she dies. I, I agree. Her. That's my answer to Steve's question. Okay. <laughs> well, that was it. Thank you. <laughs>